All right, guys. So in this video, I, to I told you that we would talk about this thing called headspace, right? So here's the headspace. And this is really what makes this method a little unique from our other gas chromatography experiments that we're going to do in our chromatography course. So this is kind of the first time that we have introduced this piece that's called headspace. What is it? Why is it important? Why should we use it? What you're seeing on the screen right now is a headspace vial. This is glass, and on top is a lid, and this lid has typically been crimped, right? You will take a crimping device, and you will put it onto this metal lid, and you will squeeze the handle, and this will crimp that lid around the rim of the glass vial that sits up here at the very top. When you do that, that com com completes a sealed environment. It's completely sealed on you. Nothing's ever going to get out. Nothing's going to come in unless you puncture through the top. There is a rubber, piece of rubber called the septa up here at the top, and a needle can puncture through that lid, go into your sample, and suck out the sample that it needs. Now, what is headspace? Headspace is really all of the gaseous molecules that's up here in the very top. Just basically the air. And that's all that this machine needs in order to do its job. It's actually not going to inject any of the liquid that's sitting down here below. Believe it or not, it doesn't even need it. But there's a few things that we have to consider here. All right, number one is going to be the temperature. This is going to be very important. And the reason, because if I take these completely cold, I'm probably going to take some of my analyte, and in this case it's alcohol, and they are not going to be in the gaseous phase. They're going to be down here in the liquid phase, or what we call the sample phase. So we need the ethanol out of the liquid and into the gas phase. And cold temperatures are not going to do that for me. They're going to hurt me, not help me. So this headspace unit has to be temperature regulated. That means we're going to put some heat on it. And this heat has to stay constant. All vials, every single one of them, samples and standards, remember, have to be treated in the same way. So it is very important that I keep these vials and containers at a constant temperature throughout the entire analysis because if I don't, how am I going to accurately compare my standards to my samples when they're all running at different temperatures across the board. It doesn't make any sense, and we can't have it. And that's one of the purposes of the headspace addition to this machine. All right? Number two is going to be pressure. These samples are going to be pressurized. Imagine this as a hairspray can. And one of the directions on the back of a hairspray can, do not throw it into the flame. If you do, the can's going to blow up, right? Well, one of the reasons is because as heat is added to this closed vessel, you're increasing the pressure inside of this vessel through gas laws because these molecules are going into the gas phase and the gas particles don't like each other. And they're going to constantly try to expand and move and keep pushing against the sides of these walls. So pressure is going to be very important. In addition to that, pressure is important in a different way as well. When I puncture this rubber and I shoot my needle down on the inside of this container, I'm going to suck up the gas particle. I'm going to have to let pressure help me with that process. Meaning that the headspace vial, this needs to have higher pressure. 
and it needs to be higher than my GC system, the pressure or the gas will go from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So if I go back up to this picture that we did of the headspace, this pressure on this side of the instrument has to be higher. That way when this needle goes down and punctures one of these containers, the gas will leave that container. And it will leave that container and it will go over into the GC system that's right here. If the pressure is the other way around, what will happen is that the GC system has pressure and that pressure will pump against the sample and it will keep it in the headspace analyzer. And you don't want that to happen, right? So pressurizing this headspace unit and pressurizing these vials to make sure that they are higher than the GC system is going to be very important. And that's actually a setting that you can make within the software. So folks, that's basically what Headspace is, all right? It is a way that we can take a sample. We're going to heat the sample up. This sample has volatile components that will leave the sample phase or the liquid and it will go up here at the very top into the gas phase. A needle will puncture down into this container. Some of the gas phase will leave the headspace vial and it will go over into the GC system where it will be um, where it will be analyzed. Another reason they use this S for sample phase, uh, notice I kept talking about liquids. That's typically what we analyze the most, but this could be solids as well. You know, solids can be heated and they can give off volatiles, and those volatiles can still be extracted and ran onto the GC system without a problem. So either one of those are okay, but we typically see liquids most often, right? Right. So that's what this abbreviation of HSGCFID is going to stand for. A couple of things in the lab that you're going to see is this Headspace Auto Sampler. So we've talked about it now. We know where that's located. This transfer line temperature. All right, so what is that? If I go back to the system, I see this big black tube that connects the Headspace to the GC system. This is the transfer line. It's transferring your sample from the headspace over to the gas chromatograph. This thing has to stay heated and it's insulated for that reason. So these volatile organics that are turning to a gas, you don't want them to condense back down by the time they get over to the GC system, right? If they do, then they're going to start trashing up this transfer line and you're going to have some cross-contamination. So you want to make sure that that transfer line is heated hot enough so that it can take the samples over here and transfer them over here without them condensing back down into a liquid. So that's the transfer line temperature. The vial pressure we've now talked about, we know the importance of it. The GC inlet, uh, that's just basically where it gets injected. So if I go back to this picture, the GC inlet, it's going to be right here where that big black tube is connected to, right? That is the entrance to my GC system, and we call that the inlet. The helium flow rate. Well, one of the things that makes this whole thing work is a big gas tank that probably sits over here to the right or left-hand side. And we get this regulator on it, and the regulator will help control the flow of helium and helium goes into the back of the GC system, and it also goes into the back of the headspace system. It's basically the gas or the air, if you want to think of it that way, but it's really just helium, not air that you're breathing in. And that pushes everything through the system from the entry point all the way to the exit point. So the helium is going to be very important. If you don't have any helium at all, it's not going to work for you. The oven temperature. Okay, so what's the oven temperature? Well, this whole process works 
because the GC system on the inside has a coil. And this coil goes round and around and around and around and around. It's about 60 meters long to 100, depending on the version that you're using. And this is what we call the column. The column is where your separation will take place. So what's getting separated? I thought we were just doing alcohol. Well, we are. We are analyzing for alcohol. But, you know, a blood sample is very complicated. It could have alcohol and it could have other uh, volatile organics that are present as well. And these are things like acid aldehyde or maybe acetone or isopropyl alcohol. It could have methanol. It could have a whole series of different things that could be there. We're just focused on ethanol, though, but this is a mixture. It's a complicated sample, and we want to separate those pieces from each other. So the column is going to allow us to do that. This column, because we talked about temperature being constant, right? It's very important. This column has a temperature dependency. So we can change the temperature of the oven that the column is housed in, and that will heat the column up or cool the column down. And if we heat or if we cool it down, we've got a little play or wiggle room in the separation that begins to happen inside of the GC system. All right, so that's why that is important. So it's very common for us to go through and talk about oven temperatures and put settings into there, which are mainly temperature-based, that allows the separation to take place place the best way possible. And finally, we have this thing called the FID flow or FID flow. And the FID to work a proper way requires air and it also requires hydrogen. So hydrogen is going to come into the system and this hydrogen is going to be used to ignite a flame. And this flame is going to analyze the components that come off of the GC system so that way it can detect them a little bit better. It looks for these ions, it looks for these charged pieces that it's making, and because they're charged, they're going to be a little bit easier to detect, and then they can start showing up on my computer screen as positive signals. So that's really all that I'm going to say about this system right now. We have a chromatography course, and that's really where we go into the nitty-gritty details of every single piece across the board here. So this is just going to be an introduction. That's all it is. Get you familiar with some of the terms so that way you're not blindsided when you get into our chromatography class a little bit later. What you're seeing here are all the settings that me as an analyst would have to go in and make to make sure that this lab procedure is going to be working the proper way. Well, if you think that this is a lot, as I scroll down the page, you're going to see even more. So if I'm using this piece of equipment, the first thing that I'm going to do as a user is just go through and double check all of these settings to make sure that they are legit, that they have been entered into the system, that no one else has came behind me to change those settings, because if just one of these settings are different, then it's going to affect my chromatograms or my data sheets tremendously. So I want to make sure that they perfectly match. A couple of things that I want to point out here. Uh, number one is this uh, sample temperature. This was the headspace vial in the auto sampler. Okay. Uh, here's the transfer line temperature that we talked about, that big black tube that connects the headspace to the GC system. Uh, as far as vial shaking, we can have the option to shake the vials within the headspace unit. A lot of times this is not required. Very few times it is going to be required, and that's something, again, we'll talk about later in a different class. The vial pressure, there we go. It looks like this is the pressure setting for the headspace system to ensure that that gas gets transferred over to the GC. Pressurization time, uh, how much do I want it to pressurize or how long before I let the gas basically go and go to the GC system for the analysis? Uh, the inlet sample, here's the GC system now that we're talking about. The inlet is the entry point, and that entry point has a temperature set at 90 degrees. This is higher than the boiling point of ethanol 
because if it was colder than ethanol, ethanol would turn back into a liquid and it would condense on the inlet and it would never go through. So I want to make sure that it's hotter than the ethanol that we are using. This split ratio, the split ratio means just that. It splits your sample into two pieces. And when it splits your sample into two pieces, it will only inject one portion and the other portion is going to be waste. So keep that in mind. We're talking about gas being injected into the GC. That is too much for the GC to handle, believe it or not. And the GC will only take a portion of that gas and inject it, and it will get rid of the majority of that sample. So a split ratio is something that we go in and we tell the machine how to split the sample up into the two pieces. The flow rates for the helium are going to be here. The temperatures for the oven are going to be here as well. We can see now what they are. It looks like it starts off colder, and then it will go all the way up to 90 degrees, and this allows some of the other pieces to come off before ethanol does in the very beginning, so that way we can slowly separate these compounds out until the very end. We can also see a FID temperature, 300 degrees, and of course a mass transfer line if you have a mass spectrometer system hooked up to this instrument, and we do not. We only have the FID. Okay. A few settings on the FID are also important, and this is the hydrogen flow rate of 40 mils per minute. That's pretty standard in order for all FIDs to work. And the air flow rate is going to be around 450 mils per minute. If I go on to the next page of the lab document, I'm going to see a couple of directions on how to prepare my samples. And this is what we're going to talk about in our third video that regards the BAC lab.